Welcome back to Archaeology After Dark, everyone. I'm your host, Daniel Rhodes. My guest today is Sam Wilson. Sam, thanks for being here. No problem, Daniel. Thanks so much for uh, inviting me on. Absolutely. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I am a conflict archaeologist um, based in the UK. That, that work primarily revolves around working on battlefields as opposed to other conflict sites. Um, that's kind of one strand of what I do. And then the other strand is a bit more day to day. I work in what we call commercial archaeology, which is developer led archaeology. Um, and that covers a bit more of a broad spectrum, basically ev every period of British archaeology, effectively. Um, so I work for one of the companies based in the UK, uh, at the moment, writing up a lot of sites. Um, previously, I've run fieldwork projects and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then I have this specialist specialism in conflict archaeology, which runs parallel to that, really. Awesome. So um, what does a conflict archaeologist do for those who aren't familiar with the term? Well, I, I suppose in general, really, you are interested in examining sites associated with conflict in some form or another. Um, some people might know it as battlefield archaeology or conflict archaeology. Really, conflict archaeology is the overarching kind of umbrella term, if you like. Battlefield archaeology is just one facet of conflict archaeology. And so within that, you can also look at, uh, say, prisoner of war camps or um, sites which are associated with conflict in some form or another, which are not directly involved in the conflict itself, in the combat, uh, uh, as it were. Um, so, as I say, my work is principally revolved around actually examining the archaeological evidence left on battlefields. Um, and that's basically looking at evidence in the form of bullets and buckles and bits and pieces, effectively, that have been fired or dropped or lost during the course of a battle. Um, and then recovering those and, and mapping them and, and, and working out what that can tell us about the nature and, and the sort of uh, different phases of that battle. Um, and also then comparing it with the historical landscape, with the contemporary accounts of the battle and, and, and seeing what might marry up, what might uh, contradict itself. Uh, and then sort of coming up with a new idea of what might have happened based on the physical evidence as well, which often battlefields have never really been examined, um, not that extensively archaeologically. Uh, and so quite often you can actually add this new layer of detail uh, to understanding, which is quite nice. Yeah, that's something that, you know, I was just thinking how, you know, battlefields across the world are actually different. Like, say you're examining a site there in the UK, it would be completely different from a battlefield that's here in the United States because, you know, the major conflicts of the world never actually came to American shores. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a, a lot of what I do um, is it, it could be comparable in, in a sense in that I, I typically deal with conflict, which is kind of the Napoleonic period and earlier. Um, so if you're looking at 19th, 18th century stuff, Obviously, you've got comparable sites in, in the US with Revolutionary War and um, American Civil War sites to a certain extent. Um, but then, of course, you keep going far enough back and you get to sites which are, again, a little, little bit different. So I spent quite a lot of time looking at medieval battlefields, for example, um, which are their own difficult challenge uh, in, its own, in their own right, really. Um, I've done a little bit of more modern stuff um, in Europe, but... Uh, in the UK, we have an interesting situation where we do have a lot of archaeology of that period, which comes under the umbrella of conflict archaeology. But of course, none of it ever got used. So Britain became heavily defended during the Second World War. And we have lots of evidence of that. But it's sort of a battlefield that never was, if you like, which makes it interesting in its own right, really. So I imagine you've seen a lot of battlefield sites do you have a favorite or one that stood out to you archaeologically yeah i mean my, my absolute favorite site that i've ever worked on is uh the battlefield of waterloo in belgium um i've been involved in a project there since 2015 which is obviously the 200 year anniversary of the battle um with an organization called waterloo uncovered and i have to give them a bit of a shout out here um, they're basically a charity doing amazing work with military veterans. So it's using archaeology as a therapeutic tool. Um, and we take these veterans and students and other archaeologists out to the battlefield every summer. And 
do all sorts of interesting archaeological work there. Um, and we've been there, as I say, since 2015, moving around different parts of the battlefields. And just the evidence that survives there is monumental. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's unlike any other battlefield I've worked on, basically. There are artifacts in the thousands as opposed to the dozens. You know, there, there's whole farm complexes which have been knocked down after the battle, which are there that you can excavate. There's farm buildings and other buildings that were there during the battle that, you, you know, have all been changed around and you can also investigate those. So not only is the archaeology just amazing from a battlefield perspective, uh, but also it has this great additional element, which is helping with military veterans and, um, and all that kind of stuff. So incredible project, really. Yeah. So to refresh those who, you know, might need it, Waterloo uh, brings Napoleon's conquest of Europe to an end. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's the culmination of uh, the Napoleonic Wars, basically. Napoleon, he, they thought he was defeated. He was sent into exile, uh, but then he manages to escape and he comes back and he raises another army and he's marching on Brussels, really. Um, and then various allied nations of which Britain is one, but there are lots of other nations involved. They form this kind of coalition uh, to defend against this uh, French aggression and Basically, it's it's very much the end of the game for Napoleon. He he gets he gets defeated and he gets it, well very soon. He he's back in exile basically somewhere else. Um, so yeah, it's it's a pivotal battle in European history. Um, widely regarded, you know, if you see lists of top top five battles, top ten battles that changed the world or whatever, Waterloo is usually in there um, because it was a, a significant event and the numbers of troops involved and the, the, the fact that the site hasn't been, there's a little bit of modern development on it around the edges, but largely it's intact. So that the landscape is quite similar to how it was in 1815. It just all lends itself to being an amazing project. And weirdly, can, despite the significance of it, there's been no formal archeology span done there really prior to our project, certainly not on a large scale, a few little bits and pieces, but you know, for such a significant battle, it's quite amazing that uh, that this project is the first one to really try and tackle it in any sort of comprehensive way. So you guys have been working on the Waterloo site since you said 2015, right? Yes, that's it. Yeah. Uh, what has uh, changed about the perception of the Waterloo battle in that time period? Well, that, that's a really interesting question. I mean, one of the things that we are spoiled with for Waterloo really is the written sources. Um, the trouble with them is that even in certain parts of the battlefield where people are effectively witnessing the same events, things are contradicting one another. They see things from different perspectives. There's smoke, there's fire, there's chaos. Um, so what we're starting to do is, is just add a little new layer of information to that story effectively you know thousands of pages have been written about this battle in the past so for example around Hougamont farm uh, which is for those who don't know there's a farm complex on the western side of the battlefield that the the allies are defending uh, some Belgian troops there and, and some British troops and the French get drawn into fighting for this farm for the entire course of the battle more or less and there's a famous uh famous incursion into the farm that the French managed to get all the way around and they come in through the northern gate of the farm. And they come through, there's, I think there's about 50 or 100 of them or something like that get through. And they uh, basically somehow get defeated and the gate gets closed. And according to one of the uh, accounts, the only survivor is a French drummer boy who they take and they put him in a barn to, to make sure he's safe. And so there's this, it, it's gained a sort of mythological status almost with re regards to the battle but no one quite understood why did this fail you know you've got all these french rushing in the gate uh, and surely they would stand quite a good chance of actually capturing at least part of the farm uh, and how did they get around behind them to cut them off and all this kind of stuff so anyway one of the objectives we had a few years back was to examine this area around the north gate and what we discovered is that the plans, the contemporary plans that showed a barn adjacent to this gate were actually incorrect. And that the barn was, I think, a couple of meters wider than the plan suggested. So that barn taken in conjunction with another barn actually gave you, the two corners of the barns came together 
and they created this choke point that was maybe only about two to three meters wide. It was remarkably small between the two corners of these buildings. And it became very clear that the area between that choke point and the north gate itself was this little killing ground that the French would have stood very little chance of actually breaking out of. And so by working out the size of that barn, we could then see, ah, right, here's a logical argument as to why this famous incursion actually failed. It's probably because they just physically couldn't get past this little narrow choke point. And to top it all off, in amongst the debris of this barn that uh, it burned down during the battle and was knocked down just after, in the debris of that, we found the tunic buttons of the Coldstream Guards and the Scots Guards, who were the British regiments defending that gate in that iconic moment, as well as uh, some uniform wire from a French epaulette and all little bits and pieces like that that had all been swept up that were evidence of that famous uh, kind of event during the battle. So we're not completely changing things, but we're just adding extra detail. And that's really where archaeology can come in, is particularly a battle like that, is just adding 10% extra that we never had before. So from that perspective, I think very, very interesting. Yeah, that's something that conflict archaeology is I'm always amazed that it brings to the table is that it brings um, more color to the picture that we have yeah. of conflict. Like when we go back and see like old footage of World War II and now we can actually put it in color. It's like that kind of difference. Yeah, it, it so, somehow kind of brings it to life a little bit and makes it more relatable because you can, you can start to see the actions of individuals. Uh, I, I mean, that that's not new in battlefield archaeology either, really. I mean, the, the battlefield archaeology was really born in, in the States, at the Little Bighorn. And uh, Doug Scott did some amazing work there in, in the 1980s and be using kind of forensic techniques to look at the firing pin evidence on the various cartridges that they found. They were able to track individual weapons across the battlefield. You know, and that's not to say it was the same person carrying that weapon, because you could never, never tell someone may have picked it up. But certainly they could track the, the movement of individual weapons. And that level of detail is is astounding, really. Yeah, that's something that, you know, I, I learned about in an archaeology class I took a few years ago, that when they reexamined the site of Little Bighorn, the narrative wasn't as clean as they led us to believe it was yeah. chaotic all over the place people running and shooting jumping on horses fleeing the scene everything absolutely yeah and, and that's where archaeology can kind of strip back all that sort of propaganda if you like and, and look at right well what does the evidence say you know you can't argue with the physical objects in the ground and if they're telling a different story well then perhaps actually they're telling the real story as opposed to the things that have been written afterwards to mythologize certain events. And that's the case with the North Gate at Hougamont. You know, so much has been written about that incident. This, there's, this, there's this idea that Wellington said it was the, the turning point of the battle, you know, the closing of the gates of Hougamont. So it's kind of gained this myth mythical status, but until a couple of years ago, we had no physical evidence of that particular engagement and the reason for its failure. Yeah, and that's another thing about conflict archaeology is you're having to work off of a story that you've been told until you find something tangible to tell you otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we, we've we found on a number of sites in the UK, and the more that we do fieldwork on these sites, the, the more that seems to actually, the more this seems to come up, is that the, the accepted battlefields where everyone says, oh, well, that's where the Battle of So-and-so was, are actually not quite right at all. You know, the location is just off and uh, somehow has got into people's minds over the centuries that, that that's where the battlefield was. The, the great example of this was from a few years ago, the uh, Battle of Bosworth, the end of the Wars of the Roses, 1485. And for years, decades, centuries, really, everyone thought the battle was in this particular location. Ambien Hill. Um, there's a visitor center there. You can go walk around it, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then a few years ago, uh, a chap called Dr. Glenn Ford, he led this project to look for the archaeology of the battle and actually discovered the battlefield about a mile and a half away up the road. And he found this huge scatter of medieval round shot that 
is the battle. You can't argue with it. You know, they're, they're, I think initially they found about 45-ish, and that counts now up somewhere about 60. And that's, that, that's unheard of. That's, you know, on, on a medieval battlefield. And so archaeology really has that power to completely change the narrative in some cases um, and, and to say, well, look, this location where everyone's interpreted it, they've drawn maps, they've put up display boards. It's just not right. There's just no evidence at all. Um, very recently, a survey I've been working on uh, ha has had a similar thing happen. This is a battle in 1646, the end of the first uh, British Civil War in the 17th century. Um, and that, that's working for an organization called the Battlefields Trust, who are sort of set up to promote research and interpretation of battlefields. And again, same story there. We have found the battle a lot closer into the town that it's named after, which is about a mile and a half to two miles away from where everyone basically thought it was. And there's a monument and there's a big red line drawn around it on maps and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's very interesting. And I think as time goes on, we'll find that is happening more and more probably. Yeah, for those of you who want uh, an American example of this, think of um, Theodore Roosevelt in the Spanish-American War. Never actually charged up San Juan Hill. It was probably a mile, a mile and a half away from where he actually was. Yeah, there you go, exactly. And, and, and these things just take on kind of new meaning over the centuries and the original meaning somehow just gets forgotten or, or lost. Well, we look at things like this, you know, the narratives of war as like a legend, something that, you know, is set in stone and it's always going to be this way. But then, you know, someone goes out to one of these battlefield sites and they find something that, you know, changes the way we look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's the that's the power of, of conflict archaeology and, and battlefield archaeology, really, in certainly in the UK. You know, a lot of archaeological work has been on done over the centuries you know the last couple of centuries or so and, and particularly in more recent decades with more developer-led archaeology and so on so we've done amazing amounts of work on prehistoric sites on roman sites on medieval sites and we you know by and large understand them very well you know there's always more information coming out but by and large we understand what the roman archaeology of the uk looks like the medieval archaeology and and, and so on but relatively few battlefields have still been examined uh, and and they're they're almost still an untapped resource ever so slightly you know as time goes on more work is is done on them of course um but as i was saying just now you know battlefield archaeology was born in the 1980s it's not that long ago uh, in comparison to more traditional forms of archaeology so we're kind of as a result of that it's lagging behind in in the fact that people have not done as much but of course, that's a great opportunity for someone like myself, um, because we, we've got lots of sites to potentially look at in the future um, and lo lots of interesting information that will still come to light, I'm sure. And that's another way that uh, I know a lot of our audience are students, and that's a great way for them to get involved and stand out in the field is do something like this that, you know, there aren't a lot of people who actually do it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. F finding new angles on things or, or new sites or, or anything like that. Absolutely. Um, and and I, yeah, I guess a bit of thinking outside the box in a way. And when I was first getting into this, I, I was a student and I just sort of went out and did it really. I, I, I read some books about stuff and I, I read about the little bighorn and work at Culloden uh, and all this kind of stuff and, and things that people had done before, basically. And I just then found the site that I was interested in, got permission from the landowner and all that kind of stuff. And and I kind of went out and did it and just learned on the job, really. And so I think there's nothing to stop you if you've got a bit of a bit of passion for, for a topic, you know, going out there and, and doing it. So I do have one question. The Waterloo site, who is the governing body of that site? I know it's in Belgium, so I would assume the... Belgium government controls it or would the French still claim occupation of it? <laughs> it's, it's basically under the jurisdiction of uh, Wallonia, which is a sort of region of, of Belgium. Um, and, and a key part of the project is working with the local authority archaeologists, basically. They're, they're effectively integrated into our team. They're very lovely people. 
we work with them all the time. Um, and so they're there from the Belgian perspective to not keep an eye, but but to sort of oversee the work that we're doing and, and to liaise with the other archaeologists who are directly determining the strategy for the site as to what's appropriate or, or what's not appropriate. They're liaising about permissions with landowners principally is one of the main things that they, they're able to do as well. Um, and then at the end of each project, we're producing a report for them which is for, for their own internal purposes, basically. So we're, we're making sure we're abiding by all their rules and regulations and, and that everything is, is done properly. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, just, it's a sort of project that you couldn't really do without having a lot of local support. And we, ha we have local support in all sorts of ways, um, but, but having those guys as part of the team is, is essential, basically. Yeah, and I think that's something that, you know, we need to make sure that people understand that we can't do these kind of projects without public support, that everyone agrees that this is good for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. You know, archaeology is a collaboration at the end of the day, and there's all sorts of cogs that need to fit together in order for a project to happen. Um, and having local people in an area that you're not entirely familiar with working with you is, as I say, it's essential um, because they can just do things and arrange things that you can't hope to do in, in, from another country at a distance. So we're about out of time for today. Sam, um, for anyone who wants to get involved in conflict archaeology or battlefield archaeology or just archaeology in general, what kind of advice would you give them? Um, Oh, well, I would say, I mean, in, in the US or the UK, look up the Battlefields Trust to start with. Um, it's a far bigger organization in the US um, and they're doing amazing work at kind of looking after preserving battlefields and all that kind of stuff. Um, but really, I, I think it's difficult because there's no big thing you can go to, if you see what I mean. There's no big database of projects, but do some do some research on the internet and try and find out who's doing projects, you know, through a university or, or an organization like the Battlefields Trust um, and, and just kind of reach out to them. That, that's effectively how I started getting experience is just reaching out to people and saying, hey, your project sounds cool. Do you need someone to come along and make the make the tea or, you know, carry bags? I don't really care. You know, if, if I can get there, then that's great. Um, and. If that doesn't work, then do it yourself. You know, get get a site that you're thinking about, that you're passionate about, go meet the landowners, work out who owns what and what permissions you need and all that kind of stuff and, uh, and read up about the methodologies and go and do it yourself uh, is what I would say. There's not really much to, to stop people doing that as long as they've got everything in place that they need. You know, I'm not sure about how the rules and regulations would differ in the US compared to the UK, but... Yeah, you know, I, I think have a bit of passion for it and you'll, you'll find a way onto a project one way or another. Yeah, and the best thing is kind of the sad thing about conflict archaeology is there are battlefields everywhere. So there's probably one yeah. within relatively short distance from wherever you all are watching this from. Absolutely. And, and if there isn't a battlefield specifically, then actually maybe there's more of a broad conflict association with the site, you know a former barracks of some kind, a training area, um, you know, depot of some sort, or just anything of that infrastructure that is, goes along with actual fighting, um, all of which are very interesting sites in their own right, really. And we are not suggesting you go out and start your own battlefield sites. Please don't start shooting your guns at each other. That's not, <laughs> that's not healthy for anyone. No, indeed. And, of course, that that is one of the considerations on, on a slightly serious note is dealing with conflict sites is, is be aware of what period the site is and therefore what dangers might be on that site. Anything that predates sort of mid 19th century, things will be relatively safe. You're not going to have things that go bang too much. But of course, dealing with more modern sites, there are far, it's far higher probability you'll encounter something that uh, will go bang or could go bang or should have gone bang. Um, particularly in France and Belgium and Germany and places that saw a lot of heavy fighting in, in the First and Second World War. So it is a consideration to bear in mind. Um, of course, safe, uh, safe practice and, and all that stuff should be, should be right up there in terms of planning any, any kind of project.
Yeah, and that's something you really need to look at while you're getting permissions to visit these sites is make sure you check with local authorities or governing bodies to see what kind of foot traffic danger there actually is. Like if you're in a more modern site, the probability of landmines isn't, you know, always a given. There could still be unexploded ordinances out there somewhere. Absolutely. I mean, you see it in, in France and Belgium all the time. Farmers are endlessly plowing up shells that haven't exploded and things like that. And it's so common, ultimately, over there that they just kind of pick them all up and put them in a big pile next to their farm gate. And someone comes along and, and kind of picks them up every now and then. But yeah, it, it goes without saying that if you are exploring any of these kind of sites, particularly more modern sites, to not venture off the beaten path too much uh, simply because a lot of these areas are still they can be unsafe um, and often the paths will have been cleared for a particular reason um, so definitely worth bearing in mind well sam thank you so much for joining us i really appreciate you being here no problem daniel thanks so much for having me and uh, i hope it's been interesting for your uh, listeners I, I hope it has too this is something a lot of people i think have questions about but there aren't a lot of places like we've said there aren't a lot of places where you can go and learn about conflict archaeology in the world really yeah absolutely and um you know if people are uh, interested in following my work at all then you can find me on instagram um i post all sorts of random pictures of stuff that i'm up to um and any questions or whatever that come about feel free to drop me a message and uh, i'll do my best to answer them all right. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, everyone.